Greetings and welcome. We are in senior AP English and uh, today we will be working with Renaissance poems. Uh, I want to begin, and I'm with you in your hymnals on page 306. We're going to start with the Chris Marlowe poem first. I want to begin by, first of all, though, saying something that you kind of already know, but you're not aware that maybe you know it. So we're going to formulate it, formalize it in some way. When we think about this notion of the guy and the girl unknown to each other, showing up at the party, looking across the room, eyes lock, all of a sudden they've never seen anything like it before in their life, wham, they fall in love. That idea of choosing your own mate is a relatively new idea. This is the first thing you want to put in your notes. That is a relatively new concept, and let's say it what Shakespeare wants us to understand it to be from Romeo and Juliet, a dangerous concept. See, it's interesting that moderns and postmoderns will define Romeo and Juliet as the play of love. Shakespeare did not write it that way. It is a play of politics. It is a political propedeutic. That that play was not watched by 15 and 16 year olds. They didn't go to the Globe Theater. Adults attended the Globe Theater. And what is it they were taught in that play? Watch your kids. Why? Because if you let them choose their own mate, think about how that play ends. Right? Think about how that play ends. We focus on their death, but that's because we're not Elizabethan viewers. Elizabethans really didn't care much about the death of Romeo and Juliet. What they were really concerned with was, oh yeah, how's the play open? You've got a major fight between two families. Political disturbance is a product of allowing young people to make up their own mind. Are you ready for this? About anything. Not just who they're going to sleep with, but about where they go, what they do. Notice Juliet. She's not supposed to ever go anywhere without the knowledge of her nurse. In other words, it's a dangerous thing when you allow young people to make up their own mind. That's dangerous. That idea is challenged in the Renaissance. And interestingly, the way it's challenged is through this notion of guy and girl, guy and girl. So poetry is one of the ways that this box starts to be opened up. And what we're going to see now, and we'll see it this hour, or we're going to see guys begin to use language to try to get the girl. Language is the way to manipulate the girl's emotions. But wait a minute, we already know this. See, Shakespeare's playing games with us and we didn't maybe realize it. Do you remember when in Hamlet, Polonius goes to the king and queen and says, I think I figured out what's the cause of Hamlet's lunacy, his distemper. And then he takes out of his pocket a folded up piece of paper. Do you remember? What is it that he starts reading to the king and queen? And the queen will even ask, is this from Hamlet? What is it that he's reading? He, wrote a love letter, he, he writes a love poem. Doubt, doubt not, not the stars doth, are, are fire. Doubt, doubt not that the earth doth move. Doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. I Blah, blah, blah. A queen will say, my son wrote this? Shakespeare's playing an interesting little game. It has become already the fashion of the court of the day. If you want the girl, the way you get the girl is to write a poem. She reads it, and then she is moved in some way. That is to say, guys using language to get the girl, and the language isn't not so much what they speak, it's what they write. It's poetry. Now, this is a far cry from the Iliad and the Odyssey. Would you agree with me? Notice Achilles doesn't write poetry to try to get Bryces. There isn't any negotiation in the Iliad. Would you agree with me? Odysseus doesn't need to try to woo, right? He has the power of his persona, and that's enough. However, by the Renaissance, let's just give it the date of 1600, although a, a real good working date is probably 1350 with the Italians and Petrarch. You already have this notion of guy trying to get girl. Now, to some degree, you've got that game being played with Dante and his Beatrice in, in uh, the Divine Comedy, no doubt. But this is going to become hyper-explicit by Boccaccio, by Petrarch, by the Italian Renaissance, 
and the, for sure by 1600 with the, with the Renaissance writers of, of uh, England. Now, of course, the irony of all ironies is that a lot of these guys are writing poetry to try to get Queen Elizabeth, who will die the virgin queen. That is to say, she never actually takes a husband. Whether she took a lover or not is of much debate. But she never <clears throat> dies married. She doesn't have a husband. But she, has, she loves the idea that guys would go after girls through the language. We will now look at several classic examples of this attempt to get the girl, girl through language. We already really have seen it, though. Sonnet 18 and Sonnet 116 both end with an observation, if this be error and upon me proved, I never writ nor no man ever loved. We're not talking about loving all humanity. We're talking about a guy <laughs> using language to try and get his girl, right? So the sonnets that are written, although there's much debate about the sonnets of Shakespeare and who they were written for, one strain of the scholarship says that Shakespeare's writing to his not female lover, but to his male lover. And there's ways to read the lines of many of the Shakespearean sonnets as to see them as, if not implicitly, if not explicitly, implicitly, implicitly um, a homosexual. And that's, again, one strand of thought, all right? But it's fairly evident from what, remember, Laertes and Polonius both say to Ophelia, you better watch him. You better watch him. He's dangerous. He will ruin you. Oh, yeah, that's what happens to Ophelia. See, if you'll look at Shakespeare's rendering of choose your own as opposed to let somebody choose for you, it always almost seems to end up badly, not good. That's not celebrated the way, of course, it will be celebrated in the 20th century, that guy meets girl and they run off and live happily ever after. You don't have that storyline in the Renaissance, but you do have the beginnings of it. Let's take a look at Christopher Marlowe's The Passionate. Notice it's not just a shepherd, it's a passionate shepherd. Uh, and then it's to his love, right? That is to say his girl, and here we go. Come live with me. And be my love. I'm with you on page 306 now. And we shall all the pleasures prove that valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, or steepy mountain yields. Come be my girl. Of course, the problem is he's a what? It's in the title. What's the problem with being a shepherd? He's got no class. Remember Romeo and Juliet? Paris shows up. He wants to marry Juliet. The father's response is two things. One, you don't even really know her. And second of all, she's still really young. Right? Paris's immediate response is, are you kidding me? There's lots and lots of girls her age that are already married. We know that Juliet's mother herself will report just a few lines later, she was basically Juliet's age when she had her first child, that is to say quite young. The problem for, uh, for this poem, however, is that he's got nothing to offer. In other words, he's a shepherd. He's got no class, he's got no money, so what is he going to offer her? Well, he's going to offer her what he has, which is to live in a field and hang out with sheep, you see. But he's going to try to make it sound. There's been any number of high school senior girls who go through this series of poems who begin to go, oh, so way back in the Renaissance, it was to still the game. I'm going to try and spin it to make it look like I'm some real catch when the truth of the matter is I'm nothing, but I'm going to give it a shot nonetheless. <laughs> Notice, and we'll sit upon the rocks, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing madrigals. I don't have money to bring in a chorus, but the birds will sing for us. That is to say, we'll live in the meadows and we'll have a great time. We'll pick flowers together and we'll watch the sheepy on the, uh, on the meadows. It'll be great. Come on, what do you say? And I'll make thee a bed of roses and a thousand fragrant poses, a cap of flowers and kirtle embroidered with all leaves of myrtle and on and on and on it goes. Sir Walter Raleigh, who was acutely aware of what it means to try to get the girl, you'll maybe want to Google his history. It's a fascinating one. He falls in love with Queen Elizabeth maybe really does fall in love with Queen Elizabeth, and then ultimately he loses his head. In the meantime, he writes some pretty remarkable poetry, but he's not without a sardonic wit. He writes a little reply, the girl's response back to the guy, and it becomes in many ways more popular than Marvel's original offering. Take a look at uh, Melville's original offering. If all the world, she's responding, some of, the, some of my high school senior girls have said, this is the way to respond to the guy. <laughs> this is the way we speak. Here we go. And you can kind of see the beginning of almost a feminist voice here that says, yeah, I know you're handsome, and I know you can speak really well, but I'm not stupid. 
Okay, I'm a girl and I'm young, but I'm not stupid. Here's the response she gives. If all the world and love were young and truth in every shepherd's tongue, these pretty pleasures might be moved to live with thee and be thy love. Ouch. What does she say? You're a liar. Yeah, you're a boy. And because you're a guy, you're going to say whatever you got to say to get what you want. And I'm not stupid enough to follow that train of thought. Nice try. If we could stay young forever, I'd think about it. But... Time drives the flock from fields to fold. When rivers rage and rocks grow cold and Philomel becometh dumb, the rest complains of cares to come. The flowers do fade in one fields to wayward winter reckoning yields. A honey tongue, ouch, a heart of gall is fancy spring but sorrows fall. In other words, how many girls have listened to the guy give his speech, his spiel, they went, oh, that's just exactly what I want. It's like out of the movies, I'm so in love, only to discover, yeah, not so much. Only then it's too late. See how that works. And so you can see a little bit of maybe an instructional tool here for Raleigh, right? Thy belt thy of straw and ivy buds, thy coral clasps and amber studs, all these in me no means can move to come to thee and be thy love. No, in other words, she shoots him down. This is the, yeah, no, 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 no. Thanks for the offer, but I ain't interested. But could youth last and love still breed, had joys no date nor age no need, then these delights my mind might move to live with thee and be thy love. Um, now, to the, now to the two sonnet offerings of Spencer. Spencer writes a series of these sonnets that you could argue are nothing more than designed to get the girl. By the way, I use the term Spencerian sonnet because I assumed that was a term you were familiar with from page 311. Now, you definitely want to know the difference between a Spenserian sonnet and a Shakespearean sonnet, of course, in its most simple instantiation, one was written by Spencer and the other was written by Shakespeare. There is a difference in the format of the quatrain development, and that's the primary difference in regards to how it works, all right? So you'll want to take a look at that. I'm not going to go into it. There's no point. I'm going to go ahead and stick with what we're doing. Most of, that, most of what we say about sonnets for the Elizabethan side are also sonnets from the Spenserian side or the Petrarchian side. Spencer was very interested in that Italian writer of sonnets, Petrarch. And so he's going to try and emulate a little bit closer. Shakespeare, to his credit, <laughs> says, I can do what Spencer does, only I can do it better. Nobody debates that, by the way, today. Sp uh, Shakespeare is considered the greatest sonnet writer of all time. Keats, by 1800, had declared him to be so. And Keats, of course, is no slouch when it comes to writing sonnets either. We'll commit one or two of Keats's sonnets to memory. How is that? You see, isn't that exciting? Schreiber is excited. I've seen excitement before. Uh, sonnet 30. My love is like to ice and I to fire. This will follow nicely on the heels of, yeah, not so much. He says, my girl is like ice and I'm like fire. What? I don't get it. We're obviously talking about the passion here, right? How comes it then that this her cold so great is not dissolved through my so hot desire? Right? But harder grows the more I her entreat. In other words, the hotter I get, the colder she gets. The more I text her, the less she wants to talk back to me. Ugh! Right? Or, how comes it that my exceeding heat is not delayed by her hard furs and cold? In other words, you take snow and dump it on a fire. You put enough snow on top of a fire, it goes out. He goes, I don't understand it. She's so cold. Why doesn't it just kill my desire for her? You would think that it would. In other words, a girl rejecting a guy should say to the guy, go away. But he says, that's not the way it works at all. The more she rejects me, the more I want to be with her. Ugh. But then I burn much more in boiling sweat and feel my flames augmented manifold. What more, he calls it miraculous. What more miraculous thing may be told? That fire which all things melt should harden ice, and ice which is congealed with senseless cold should kindle fire by wonderful device, such is the power of love in gentle mind, that it can alter all the course of kind, kind here meaning nature. In other words, it's interesting, some have argued that Spencer <coughs> seems to be arguing that love is unnatural. Natural is heat melts, melts snow, or lots of snow kills fire. That's natural. That's what we understand in the world of nature. Spencer says love is something quite different. It is almost unnatural or it goes against the natural order. And to that degree, hard to explain, dare we call it a miracle of sorts. Now, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing is open to debate. He doesn't seem to be saying, yay, I'm lying in bed all night sweating in torment because I can't be with the girl I love. That, it doesn't seem to be a yay. It rather seems more to be like a 
drats. I wish I could be with the girl I love. Why can't I be with the girl I love? Why is it that I can't convince her to be with me? It's almost as if this sonnet is an attempt to try to come up with an answer and at the same time maybe give her an answer. That is to say, try and talk her into it. Sonnet 75, and yes, of course, if you want, you can go online. There are a few, a few more sonnets between 30 and 75. Spencer was cranking these things out at the tune of one or two a day. Um, one day, and for those of us who are writing a sonnet, we're now going, geez, how can they like throw these together so quickly? Take a look. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. We've got one or two senior girls who are going to roll their eyes at this one. One day I wrote, and then we got a few guys who are going to take comfort from a poem like this and say, oh, it's, yeah, it works, it works. Take a look. One day I wrote her name upon the strand. By the way, strand just means beach. So he's walking along the beach with this girl and he keeps writing her name in the sand with maybe like a stick or his finger or something like that. But came the waves and washed it away. Again, I wrote it with a second hand, but came the tide, made my pains as prey. In other words, every time she, he wrote her name on the sand, the, the ocean's waves would come and wipe away the name. She calls him vain, that is to say silly, right? It's useless, it's useless. Vain man, said she, that doth in vain assay a mortal thing so to immortalize. In other words, she's like, why are you trying to immortalize my name or make my name remembered by writing it in the sand? The wave, the action of the wave taking away my name is natural. That's just the way things are. <clears throat> For I myself shall like to this decay and eke my name be wiped out likewise. Not so, not so quote I. She, in other words, now he's going to respond. And his response is to say, no, no, no. This is not the way life is at all with you. You are special. Again, one or two girls roll their eyes on that one. Like a girl's never been told she's special by some guy, right? No, not so, quote I. Let baser things devise to die in dust, but you shall live by faith. My verse, your virtues rare, shall eternize. And in the heavens write your glorious name. I'm going to make you live forever. You can imagine that she's kind of like rolling her eyes at this point going, oh, brother, really? He goes, no, no, no. I'm going to make you live forever by writing poetry about you. And now to the final couplet, which will sound something like Sonnet 18 of Shakespeare, and as well to some degree Sonnet 116, but for sure Sonnet 18, where when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live and later life renew. He says, every time this poem is read, your name or who you are will be remembered and you'll be celebrated. Now, of course, when Spencer says this to the girl, you can kind of imagine she goes, oh, jeez, a guy will say anything to get what he wants. But we did just read the poem. And to that degree, somewhere, if Spencer's around, he's got to be going, told you so. That is to say, I wasn't lying. See? My fame and your fame, it's all the same. Come on, what do you say? I, I won. You can imagine she's probably looking at him like, yeah, no. Sonnet 18, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? I think we already have worked with a bit. And uh, he says basically the same thing. So long as men can breathe, their eyes can see. So long lives this and this gives life to thee. Again, you can imagine this girl kind of rolling her eyes going, whatever. A guy will say anything. But here again, we read the poem today. And each time we read Sonnet 18, we are remembering his girl that he was writing for. Sonnet 29 is a little bit interesting poem. <laughs> This, I like this poem on uh, page 320. I like this poem because it tells us that this great genius, Shakespeare, the writer of Romeo and Juliet, the writer of Hamlet, the writer of Lear, the writer of Henry V, the writer of all these sonnets, we realize from this poem has tremendous self-doubt about who he is and what he is. Now that's fascinating. He himself, in his own lifetime, Shakespeare, had no idea that he would be so famous. How do we know that? We'll take a look. Look what he says in three, on page 320. This is Sonnet 2-9. When in disgrace, by the way, this is a love poem. This is just a roundabout way for the guy to get to the girl. Okay, this is a roundabout way. When in disgrace, with fortune in men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state. Wow. He tells us, when I have this feeling that I'm, I'm no good, I'm disgraced because I'm a looser. This is Shakespeare saying, I'm a looser of a writer. I'm never going to be known. It, it, right, we kind of, we're kind of amazed by this. 
This is the cat that wrote the play Hamlet who says, I'm kind of a loser. Nobody really respects me. And trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts myself, almost despairing. He says, when I get to the point that I'm completely full of despair, that I'm a complete loser and I'm never going to be remembered for all this garbage that I've been writing. Mm -hmm. He says, at that moment, line 10, and then all of a sudden it becomes a love poem. And again, you can kind of start to predict this. Oh, really? Here we go. Happily, I think on thee. Oh. And then my state like to the lark bird at break of day arising from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Oh, He says, I would rather be with you and be poor and a, and a nobody than to be a king and be famous. You're way better than fame. I don't know. You know it's hard to know whether anyone would buy that or not. Uh, Sonnet 116, I think we've already looked at. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. And one or two of us have worked to try to commit that one to memory. Or some of us are continuing to work to commit that to memory. Yeah. Miss Katie says, let's join the cheerlead squad and be done with that. <laughs> Sonnet 130, here we go. Now, this is one of the great Jack poems of all time. By Jack, I mean here. There are many people who argue that Shakespeare is getting, kind of jabbing at, the, at his girl. Others will say, this is one of the great love poems that seeks to try to get away from that whole thing if you're the most beautiful woman in the world, right? That is to say, uh, maybe this is Shakespeare's attempt to say, you're normal and I love you for that. Let's take a look at how he says it. My mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun. This is, of course, a famous, famous sonnet and a famous first line. He says, yeah, my, my girl's eyes, they, they're not like the sun, right? In other words, they're not very beautiful. She doesn't have very good eyes. Coral is far more red than her lips red. She doesn't have very pretty lip, red lips. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done? The irony, and we find this out from a poem like this and elsewhere. Uh, in Shakespeare's day, women were considered more beautiful the paler they were, the whiter, paler they were. If you had any kind of tan of any kind, you were considered to be lesser beautiful. Because you were working. Right. You kind of worked in the sun and that kind of thing. So notice the switch. I mean, now, of course, there's a, big, there's a big switch here, and it seems like maybe young ladies like to have some tan or whatever, you see. So he says, yeah. He says, my girl, my girl's not very, she's not very, not very white at all. She's not very pretty. Um, notice the next one. If hairs be wires, black hairs grow on her head. I've seen roses to mask red and white, but no such roses see on her cheeks. She doesn't have that pretty, that pretty coloring in her cheek. Uh, and in some perfumes, there is more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. Uh, yeah, she doesn't, have, she doesn't have very good breath. When she talks and I'm up close to her, i got to go, whoa, whoa, you need a tic-tac, that kind of thing, right? <laughs> I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. In other words, she doesn't really have that melodious a voice, right? The, uh, I grant, I never saw a goddess go, my mistress when she walks... Yeah treads on the ground. So in other words, you know, there had been people who had written poems about how when my girl walks, she glides like a goddess across the floor. And he goes, no, nah, not my girl. She just walks. Uh, she basically just kind of tramps across the floor, you see. So, I mean, it's up to, it's, it's at that point, and, and now you notice you got your three quatrains, that it basically said, there isn't anything special about my girl. She doesn't have beautiful eyes. She doesn't have beautiful lips. She's, you know, doesn't have beautiful skin. She doesn't have, you know, real pretty hair. I mean, he's basically covered all of those kind of physical attributes that Romeo celebrated about Juliet standing in her garden watching her. If you go back and look at those lines, you, you got Shakespeare kind of making fun of himself here. Romeo's going off about how beautiful Juliet. Oh, she does teach the stars to shine and all that kind of crap. Uh, notice he says about his girl here, yeah, none of those. My girl's completely ordinary in every way. But the final rhymed couplet will make us debate now what really he's saying. And yet, by heaven, I think my love's as rare as any she belied with faults compare. What does he say in the final, in the final two lines? Even though she's normal, to me, what? What does the word rare mean to you? 
often. Find yeah, she's like the she's like the perfect girl. I mean, even though she's none of those other things, normal is better than some fantasized great, exaggerated. yeah, exaggerated, hyperbolic kind of girl, which raised a really interesting question when this poem started to be read and studied. And it takes us back to Chaucer's Wife of Bath. You can have me as a Victoria's Secret model, but you'll always have to doubt my, vi my fidelity. Or you can have me as not physically a stunning attractive, but I'll be the most amazing companion to you. And there were a lot of guys that really wrestled with that you know, dilemma. Remember, our poor knight just says, I don't know, you decide, you can decide. Uh, the Patriarch's Son, it's 9292. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just talk about very briefly for your notes as you get ready for the exam. You can study on your own. Uh, in Sonnet 90, first of all, you've got a speaker of the poem, probably Petrarch, who's falling in love with a woman who he compares to an angel. This is funny, given that we just looked at 130. An angel, a heavenly sight, a living sun, all of these kinds of, you know, bad country, bad country song lyrics. You know, that kind of thing, right? Uh, deep as the valleys, high as the mountains, you know, on and on it goes, right? He says that what he believed was a look of pity from this woman when she, he tried to, you know, invite her to be his, uh, caused his love for her to ignite, which sounds a whole lot like what Spencer's saying, right, about my love is, uh, is like to ice a night of fire. Uh, although his beloved's beauty has now faded, his love endures, which is interesting. In other words, even though she's no longer physically beautiful, probably due to aging, he still finds her this just remarkable, remarkable woman. Uh, in Sonnet 292, he, uh, he again is back to, it's Italians, come on. I mean, uh, you know, they love to talk about physical beauty, probably because they are the most physically beautiful people on the planet and have been for a really long time, right? Uh, he talks about her physical beauty, right? And uh, he says... She's made earth a paradise for him, right? And uh, in other words, she's so stunningly beautiful that when I look at her, I completely forget about all the ugliness in the world, you see, right? And so, uh, inspired him to write poetry. That's another thing he says in 292. It's like the muse, right? When I look at her, I want to write poetry about her, and this is all good. <clears throat> but she's dead, and this is important in 292. And so now he lives in grief. And... His muse is gone. His poetic inspiration is gone. That is to say, the very reason that he ever had for writing poetry, now gone. So 292 is in many ways really sad or tragic kind of, of poem. Now, for those of you who are at all familiar with that motif where you have the lonely artist, writer, poet, painter sitting in his New York City loft, you know, brooding and sad and all that, a lot of that comes from this Renaissance ideal of the lonely, tortured artist. But by 1800, when we get to Lord Byron, we'll see it even better. All right, let's now turn to the last of our offerings, and uh, we'll make some observations uh, um, starting on page um, 524. Um, I'll go there. Um, you know what? Let's go to 513 just for a second. I'll, I'll just make a few observations before we get there, okay, Damiano? I want to get to those other poems. But uh, Holy Sonnet 10. By the way, take a look at Dunn, it, uh, Dunn's Sonnet on 513. Uh, this is a beautiful poem that often is read at funerals. And it runs something like this. You know, back to our two-box theory. Remember on the board yesterday with Plato's Theory of the Forms? But Dunn says it this way in Holy Sonnet 10. If I say it this way, you can remember it as a mnemonic. He says, death is what? What are you, death? And he writes directly to the concept of death. What are you, death? And then he goes back to Plato's theory of the forms. And he says, if you think of yourself as box one, a body, then obviously you fear death because death removes that body. Not only does everything sag and bag, in the end, as Hamlet says, we're all food for maggots, right? Remember, Act 5 of Hamlet begins at a graveyard, right? But if you think of yourself in the second box as a spirit or a soul, and that's what you really are, then what can death do to that? Death is like going to sleep. And to that degree, the final lines of the sonnet notice, he says, and death shall be no more once I'm dead I don't have to worry about dying anymore. Death, thou shalt die. That is to say, I've got nothing to fear. It is a fundamentally very Christian kind of response to death. That is to say, of or related to that second box. 
And a lot of readers took great comfort and solace from Sonnet 10 to say, what's there to fear in dying? But, as is often pointed out by humanists, long before that Christian observation, 399, remember, is the year that Socrates drinks his hemlock shake in BCE, right? Socrates obviously no Christian if he's born 400 years before Christ, and yet in the Phaedo, he's making the same argument. There's absolutely nothing to fear of death if you believe in the second box, and how can you not believe in the second box? Because clearly you are more than just a body. Meditation 17, I wish I could spend an entire hour with, with you on page 514. Uh, no man is an island. Uh, jump down to the very end. Uh, this whole thing is started by that bring out your dead, hearing the bell ringing. Um, dead bodies, right? Um, no man is an island entire of the main. We're all connected in some way, he says. When one person dies, that's a loss to all of us. We're all kind of connected in some kind of mystical way. Again, remember, he is a metaphysicist. By the way, therein on page 515, number 6, that question about metaphysical conceits, the conceits that we were talking about are those comparisons, right? Make sure you know that word before you show up for the exam. Ben Johnson is a contemporary of Shakespeare's. I'm now with you on the two poems starting on page 518. On my first son, Ben Johnson's poem, he mourns the death of his seven-year-old boy. I should point out, people die all the time in Shakespeare's time. Children die all the time because you don't have medicine and stuff. So one small cold and a kid can die. I mean, to get to even the age of 20 is a major feat, okay, because uh, so much germ and death. So he loses his seven-year-old boy. He thinks it fortunate, however, that the boy has escaped the hardships that older people face, old age and the like, and he wishes his son, a, uh, he called it his son the best piece of poetry he ever wrote, which is an interesting, interesting way for him to say it. He re hopes his son has a peaceful rest, right? He concludes that he's got to keep himself from loving too much because losing a loved one is so painful. To Celia, the other poem here, um, you've got more love poetry, the love for Celia. He argues his, uh, you know, his, his love uh, for her and that she should love him back. When she sends back his gifts of roses, he claims that, they were take, that, that they've taken on her fragrance. It's like there's no way to reject them. Uh, you know, you're telling me I got a chance is the famous line from Dumb and Dumber, right? Um, and this is basically the same thing. She sends back his roses. He smells the roses and says... I can smell her in the roses. Yes, thank you for sending them back to me. You know, that kind of thing. You kind of look at it as pathetic or whatever. <clears throat> All right, how to address now the final three poems in the, in the few minutes I have remaining. Well, here's the problem. Your textbook company knows. See, I'm looking with you on, on uh, page, for example, uh, 522. Your textbook company knows that if it's going to put together an anthology of British poetry, it has to mention these two poems of To His Coy Mistress and To the Virgins Don't Make Much of Time. Uh, every, everyone knows that because these are two of the most famous poems. The only problem is that both of these poems say the same thing. The guy is saying to the girl, we're only young once, let's get to it. And the it... There's no confusion about what we mean by the it. But the problem for your textbook company is that obviously they can't celebrate the obvious sexual tenor of the poems. And so the way they do it is on page 523 to inject the theme of the great Horace line, carpe diem. That is to say, seize the day. In other words, try to say that these poems are about, let's really look forward to the moment that we have. Well, it's awfully hard to miss it unless you're, uh, unless you're a pretty you know, dense reader. Uh, let's just look at the 526 Robert Herrick poem, which is probably what some have said cliff notes for the, uh, for the Marvel poem to his coy mistress. They both say the same thing. It's just that Marvel takes a lot longer to get around to it. One or two freshman girls, can I say it this way, have heard this argument. To the virgins to make much of time. By the way, 526 is where I am. Notice it's not virgin, it's plural. <clears throat> so, right, this poem, this poem is an invitation to all young girls, all Ophelias. It's not get thee to a nunnery. That is to say, protect your sexuality and all that. It's rather, you know, really? Come on. Take a look. 
gather ye rosebuds while ye may, old time is still a-flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying, and can't miss the symbolism of flowers opening and, the la and all of that. The glorious lamp of heaven, the sun, the higher he's a-getting, obviously the sun is kind of an, you know, a symbol of we're getting older or whatever, the sooner will his race be run and nearer he's to